All right, so family, uh, welcome to the first annual Inland Empire Church of Christ Black History Celebration. Uh, we are so excited that we're having this event. We're so excited that we get to be here uh, together celebrating one another. And we have a magnificent lineup for you today. So we got you know, special music, we got some personal stories, we got uh, a nice children's play. Many of you, uh, your kids have uh, showcased their artistic talents. We can't wait to see that. And we got a few special treats for you. So please don't leave too early because you're going to miss the special treats. And I don't know anybody who doesn't like special treats. Sure. I like special treats. He does. Uh, speaking of special treats, somebody has a whole lot of stuff that they have <laughs> brought for show and tell. Mm -hmm. uh, Lavise, can you can you tell us what's what's all this? Okay, I, I just thought I would um, share a little bit about my background and take a page out of my Black history by sharing some things that my parents have done for me. So, my mommy used to buy me Barbie dolls. She bought me white Barbie dolls and she bought me black Barbie dolls. So, this is an example of Rosa Parks, and here's an example of Ella Fitzgerald. Aren't they beautiful? <laughs> they are. Hold up. Oh, thank you. Oh, I get to touch them. Yay. <laughs> okay. What this did for me as a young person coming up is it gave me the opportunity to look upon um, women of color and to just see them as beautiful and vibrant and an important member of the household and of society. So it helped to develop my sense of self. So thanks, mommy. Um, and what my dad did for me was he bought me books, stacks and stacks of books. So my dad always encouraged me to read widely and vastly. So he said, always read um, works by Native Americans, Asian authors, um, Hispanic and Latino authors. But he encouraged me to read the classics. His favorite was John Steinbeck. So I have a bookshelf filled with Steinbeck um, <laughs> books. Um, but also, um, he encouraged me to read about our community and to really, again, develop a sense of self and to, to know ourselves deeply by reading and talking about what we're reading and connecting. So um, this is one of uh, the formative books, um, Gordon Parks, The Learning Tree, which helped me to understand what it's like for young Black men coming of age, um, this was a formative piece too, Black Boy by Richard Wright. I read this at many different times in my life, <laughs> when I was 14, when I was 20, in my 30s. Um, every time I approached the text, I was different. And so I got something from it. So again, this was a piece that um, talked a lot about what life was like in the South, and it encouraged my understanding of the Great Migration. And finally, you can't really read in the Black literacy canon if you don't check out some Toni Morrison. Mm -hmm. So Toni Morrison and Maya Angelou, Queens. the Queens, absolutely. So again, um, my dad really encouraged me and he, he still does. For my birthday, he sends me books. So for mm -hmm. me, that's, that's a page out of my family Black history book, like the things that helped to make me who I am and the things that I pass on to my own children. So thanks for listening. And her dad is encouraging her all over the house because these books are everywhere. Uh, Ryan helps too. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> uh, and sometimes I read them when she when she lets me touch them. <laughs> uh, but you know this, what we're doing and what we're talking about today re reminds me of the scripture, and that's uh, Revelation seven nine, um, and it reads, "There before me was a great multitude that no one could count." from every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. At the end of this age, all believers from all corners of the globe will stand before Jesus. They will represent every nationality and every color of skin. This is the true hope of reconciliation. And that just inspires me because we keep in mind that, you know, Black history is American history. It's all of our histories. And so it just makes, when I read that scripture, I just get so excited, uh, especially about what we're doing today. Uh, so we're going to take a moment to pray. Uh, and right after I pray, you will be greeted by uh, our handsome host, Jeff Mossinger, who's going to guide you through the rest of the uh, celebration. So let's pray, family. 
Lord God, thank you so much for this time that we get to spend together celebrating your people, Father. Uh, we pray that this moment in time uh, brings us all closer together uh, and gets us a better understanding of your plan for your whole people. Uh, bless us all, Lord God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's go. Thank you so much, uh, Best Family. Uh, amazing beginning and, and uh, guiding us through uh, just um, why we're here and where we want to go. So um, super appreciate that. Um, I would, I need to do some more reading to catch up. I don't have that many books, but, uh, it's exciting. Yes, we are, uh, Jeff and Melanie Mossinger. We're part of the IE squad. And again, welcome. Super excited to have so many people here. Um, I'm going to be kind of transitioning, helping us with the transitions between the speakers and the different events. And, uh, we've got a lot planned, a lot of great things, exciting things coming up. The first off, we're going to start with Mr. Scott Kirkpatrick, who is, on the ICOC squad, who's going to give us a little bit of the, the history of the squad. So at this time, we'll be listening from Scott. Well, it's such a, a, a great thing. I thank you guys so much for allowing me to be a part of this. Uh, if I can share my screen, that'd be fantastic. If you guys don't mind, I'm gonna hit share screen here and, uh, and I'm gonna go through um, uh, kind of my presentation. I have 70 minutes. so. Uh, just buckle in and we'll take, a, we'll go on a ride here. Okay. So uh, come on, let's, let's do this. Um, so uh, the introduction of the squad, uh, let me, let me start this thing. Uh, but, so uh, what is a squad? A squad is a group of disciples that has been chosen from the leadership of the churches uh, to really discuss on uh, how can we navigate through these troubled waters when it comes to diversity uh, in culture, race, or, or, you know, or any social issue. But, but mainly we're focusing on culture and race uh, at this moment. And so our churches really around the world now uh, are, have heard of squad or starting squads. And I'll talk about that in just a second. But, um, but it started back, the, the initial thrust of the squad uh, started back in 2012. You guys remember the World Discipleship Summit? Can you guys see that? Uh, you remember that incredible time, right? You remember all those people, 17,000 people from around the world in our fellowship of churches was in San Antonio. Wasn't that an incredible weekend? Uh, and so, but behind the scenes, and many people didn't know this, we had a breakfast with a, with a bunch of leaders. And these are some of the leaders that were there. And uh, Steve Staten and myself pulled this thing together. And we had a breakfast to talk about just some of the issues that, that face our fellowship. And these are the five topics that we had different brothers preaching from. Um, trust, development, training, and support of, uh, of you know, African-American and or um, leaders of color, right? You know, what are we doing in terms of that? Uh, the second point was having the belief in that, th that these men and women could lead churches uh, of, of major size or in major cities. Um, the lack of young in campus ministers was the, was the third topic. The fourth topic was the lack of African-American elders. At the time, I think we had a little over 100 elders and only 10% or less than 10% of those elders were of color. And so we realized that we had some major issues going on. The last point that we talked about at that breakfast was the mar marginalization of, of African-American leaders, church leaders. At the time, uh, we were losing uh, church leaders to the Christian church, right? They were taking their whole fellowships away from the ICOC and aligning with the Christian church. So we, or they were just leaving. And so we're like, what is happening? So that's what this breakfast was about. And so in that meeting, uh, I remember Bruce Williams asked, hey, well, listen, can y'all give us some stats? I mean, we, we appreciate the discussions. We appreciate what you guys are saying, but we need some numbers. And so we went and, and did that. We went and got the numbers. Um, I'm trying to advance this thing, but it won't advance. Okay, so 
Um, anyway, so I'll keep going. I don't know why my computer won't advance to the next slide. Maybe I need to hit stop share and then it go. Are you are you still there? Uh, let me see here. Okay, I should know how to use this thing by now. You know what I'm saying? So, um, but this is where these are the stats. So we went and got the stats, and this is just a, a just a brief, just you know, bird's eye view. We went and got the stats. Once we got the stats about the dynamic, uh, the dynamics of, of people of color and leadership of our churches, it was embarrassing to see the state of our fellowship. And so uh, we did all the research, we got the stats. We wanted to give the stats to the leadership. It actually, um, we, we turned it over to the leadership. They did not realize that we had given the stats to them until 60 years later when we were presenting in Orlando, Florida. And, and, and so when we were doing a presentation, one of the brothers asked, so why don't we know this? Why haven't we heard this before? And we said, well, we tried to tell you guys six years ago, but you, wouldn't, you, you, did, you didn't listen. And so when they saw the stats, they're like, oh my goodness, we need to do some things. So this was back in 2019. Okay, and so, but we realized that there's no, there's no need to get angry or anything about that. We, we got to realize that we are the light of the world and that what we need to do is come together and form groups that can attack these issues, but really build unity in our churches. And that's when we, you know, we started to put the squad really out there in our fellowship of churches. And so now, um, two years after 2019, of course, we have squads in about 60 to 70 churches in America, just North America, and we have squads all over the world now. Uh, our goal is for a squad to be in every fellowship in our fellowship of churches. That's our goal. And so I met with uh, our ICLC squad today, and these are some of the things that we're going to be talking about coming soon. We, we are developing a website uh, for, for squads that, you know, to be able to go and get resources from. Uh, we are... Uh, developing next generation uh, of leaders that will continue the work that we're beginning. Uh, we are expanding the, the ICLC squad, uh, you know, because we are developing uh, um, uh, committees for the squad to branch out to make sure uh, that people don't get tired, don't get wore out, uh, but that we can spread the wealth throughout. So uh, you will be Please, and what God is doing because of 2020, God did something amazing. He uh, shut down the whole world and had us to focus in on, uh, you know, pretty much a a, a public lynching, uh, which which made us uh, talk about these things. And because of this, our squads are vital to the existence of our movement. And uh, so we have, like I said. Uh, over over 50 squads in North America alone, and then many more outside. But please be praying because our goal is to have a squad in every fellowship in our fellowship of churches. Thank you so much. That's an update on the squads uh, around America and kind of where we began and hopefully where we're going. Thank you so much, Jeff. Thank you, Scott. Uh, no sharing the history but uh guiding us through spiritually how how it all came together sometimes um you know it's all about god's timing you're right and uh i'm, I'm glad that that that's the goal one in every fellowship of churches i mean that's pretty awesome and uh so glad to have you now a part of uh, the ie uh region here and uh, you and your wife and your family and uh, looking forward to continually to learn from you and all your wisdom you've been doing this a long time so looking forward to that thank you again scott incredible job right now we have um the next thing we have are a couple of amazing women 
who want to share some personal stories about some people in their lives that have inspired them. And the first of those two women will be Angelis Corbin. Angelis. There we go. I couldn't yeah. unmute myself. <laughs> okay. So hello, everybody. I'm really excited to share. I think when I was thinking, who can I share about? There's so many people that came to mind and they're, you know, famous people, all of these people, but I thought who in my life specifically has impacted me in a very positive way. And for me, that's been my aunt, my aunt, her name is Michelle Banks, and she's just amazing. She's a native of LA. So she's near here and she is a fighter fighter paramedic. And she's been doing this for so long. She just recently retired, but um, from 1984 until this past year, she's been uh, one of the first ac actually African-American firefighters. She was the third uniformed African-American woman and the second African-American female paramedic and the first special assistant to the fire chief. So she's done some amazing things just in the, the, the fire department itself and been able to be at some amazing tables and make impactful decisions. And that was all because she, you know, decided she was going to go to school. She was always learning and definitely inspired me to have a hunger for learning. And she's got her bachelor's in health administration and a master's in organizational leadership. And she uses all of this actually in a more recent way to be able to create the African-American Fighter Fire Museum. And this is a place in LA that once COVID is over, you can actually go back to visiting and just really learning the history that there were certain uh, fire stations that were actually designated for Blacks only. And this was one of the few that, that they've created this museum in. And she's been able to help co-found that and really teach the history of those that were serving in different ways. And even though they were still marginalized because of the color of their skin, they were still out there serving and helping and impacting people's lives in a positive way. And she's not only done great things for the community, but she's also um, been won a couple of different awards that the Senator in 2013 awarded her the, the Shiro Award, as well as the LA City Women of Courage Award in 2000. And more recently, I think it was just a couple of days ago, she was able to share with a couple of different news stations about the museum and just everything that's going on in LA. So if you want to know more, I'm going to try to put the link in the chat if you guys can uh, see that, but just research African American Fighter Fighter Museum to just learn more and, and see how, in spite of the challenges that people face, they were still able to do so much more and impact people in a positive way. Incredible, Angelise. Wow. I did not know all that. That is, that is super, super cool. Would love to meet her. That, um, so we go straight from Angelise to uh, Miss Brittany Cowens. Hey guys, today I'm going to be sharing with you about a married couple, uh, the Greers. So Mr. Greer was my middle school teacher for world geography one year and then U.S. history the next. And uh, when I tell you I hated this man, I hated this man. <laughs> For the first year, we bumped heads like nothing else. His favorite catchphrase, uh, catchphrase was, kick rocks, Brittany, go to OCS. Um, because I had a problem with authority and I didn't know how to properly express that. Uh, and so we had to duke it out a lot. Uh, but this man was amazing. Um, and he taught outside of the curriculum. And I learned things about history that my peers didn't learn about um, until we were in college. Right. And I started learning about it in middle school. And so uh, eventually we um, kind of got over our differences. <laughs> I learned a lot from him about how to properly approach authority and like things like that um, and how to be proud of myself for being smart, even if I was made fun of it, uh, made fun of for it by my peers. Um, and just how to communicate in a better way. So I grew to love him. And uh, then he, his wife, and his wife partnered with some other teachers to start the Malcolm X Saturday Academy. And so we would get together on Saturdays and we had math class for people who were struggling in math. We had black history. 
uh, to learn about like the history that's not taught about us and black English, black literature, I should say. Um, so I was exposed to writings and authors that I never would have been exposed to otherwise. I learned to be proud of who I was because I had a history outside of slavery. And that was amazing. Um, and that continued through uh, like the first year of high school. Um, and so he gave tutoring and resources that were not available to me in other places. Uh, and Mrs. Greer, she taught English at a different school, so I only interacted with her on Saturdays, but I looked up to her and she became kind of the inspiration for the woman that I would want to build myself into. So she was teaching and she was going to law school and she was a mom and then later she wrote a book. <laughs> so she was um, this awesome teacher, lawyer, author, mom, right? Uh, who was strong, beautiful, smart. She was black and like proud of it. She had healthy relationships and seeing her do so much made me feel like I could do the same thing, right? Um, so it was just, it was so nice to have people like embrace me and like build me up for being smart. Um, instead of saying like, you talk white, they're like, no, you are an intelligent young black woman. Uh, also, they took us to colleges. They gave our parents information that they didn't have otherwise for scholarship information and things, scholarship information on scholarships and things of that nature. Um, and since then, uh, the Malcolm X Saturday Academy isn't anymore, but they've started other literacy programs and are working to bridge the education gap. So I just think they're amazing. Wow. Andres and Brittany, both you shared about people who inspired you, but uh, I think you both are inspiring us by your confidence and just how passionate you are. Just appreciate what you shared. Very inspiring. Very inspiring. Thank you. Brian did say at the beginning that we're going to have some special treats here, so it's good <laughs> to hear from everybody. But at this time, we're going to have the, the children's play. And so our technical expert, Mr. Rodney Lloyd, is going to go ahead and cue that up for us so we can watch. Start music and get busy studying. We've got a literary test this week. Dad, come on. I have enough of this studying. History is so boring. Who cares about this stuff anyway? This is 2021. Kids are the ones making history now. I don't need this history stuff. You do. Now. Get to work or no you too this week. And keep that music down. I'm trying to watch my opera shows. Okay, Dad. Who needs this history stuff anyway? are the heroes of history. The heroes you don't think are important to study. But without our dedication and sacrifice, many of the things you kids enjoy today would not have been possible. You and your generation have the way paved for your success because of what we did first. My name is Katherine Johnson. I worked for NASA and because of my math skills, America became the first country to put a man on the moon. See, without the achievements of those before us, we may never have had the success that we enjoy during our lives. Heroes from the past inspire those today to be great. Oh, that's right. I remember you. You were in that movie, Hidden Figures. Great movie, by the way. So, ma'am, who inspired you? 
George Washington Carver. Many people know me as the plant doctor. I use many different types of crops to invent over 300 plant-based products. I became famous worldwide for my skills as a scientist and inventor. Even the president asked for my help. With my knowledge of plants, I helped many southern farmers improve their crops and diets. Ever heard of Ford Motor Cars? Henry Ford started that company I was a good friend of mine. Sci scientist, inventor, botanist, chemist, that's me, George Washington Carver. I am General Colin Powell. I was the first African American chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff in the U.S. Army. I also was National Security Advisor for two U.S. Presidents. But way before any of that, other African Americans served our country with excellence like James Armistead Lafayette. James Army who? <laughs> you don't know who James Armistead Lafayette is? James Armistead Lafayette's the name. Winning the American Revolution, that's my game. I was an African American spy during the war. I'm the original 007. I posed as a runaway slave and worked for the British Army as a waiter. As an undercover agent, I discovered enemy secrets. I was the CIA and the FBI. <laughs> Long before that bong, I learned how to spy. With the information that I discovered, the Patriots were able to block thousands, thousands of enemy troops during the Battle of Yorktown, winning the American Revolution. Don't forget that name, kid, James Armistead Lafayette. You probably already know that I was the first African-American president of the United States, but if it wasn't for the hard work and dedication for many others before me, I never would have had the honor. People like Douglas Wilder paved the way for my success. Well, everyone knows who you are, sir, but who is... You don't Daddy? know who Douglas Wilder is? The name is Douglas Wilder. I was the first elected African-American governor in the United States. Some people call me the son of Virginia. For me, politics is simply money talks. So as governor, I made sure that money was spent on needs and no nonsense. I was such a powerful figure in the U.S. politics that they called me the kingpin. My name is Christopher James Priest. Never heard of you. Kid, have you heard of superheroes? Have you heard of Marvel and DC comic books? Huh? I was the first African American editor and writer to work for the big superhero comic book companies of today. I'm the guy that made the Black Panther superhero cool. No way I've been saying Wakanda forever without my sacrifices and my dedication. But before me, there are much more important writers in history who made my success possible, like, uh, let's say, uh, Phyllis Wheatley. Well, I definitely know who you are now, but who is Miss Cream of Wheat? You don't know who Phyllis Wheatley is? I am Phyllis Wheatley. In 1753, I was born in Africa, but at seven years old, I was brought to America as a slave. Through hard work and dedication, I became a talented poet, and eventually the first published Black American in history. My poetry was so impressive that the King of England wanted to meet me. George Washington even wrote to me during the revolution and said that my work was excellent. At that time, some people fought with the sword, but for me, I fought with my pen. My name is Oprah Winfrey. I was the first black female billionaire. I have faced many challenges through my career in television and business, but I was inspired to achieve great things by the many successful black women that came before me, like Maggie Walker. Child, please tell me you know who Maggie Walker is. Nope. But my dad does love to watch the shows, though. Child, just, just listen. Hello, dear. My name is Maggie Walker. I was the first African-American bank president in history. If I was alive today, I'd afford Bugattis, Ferraris, Lambos, you name it. But during my time, I reinvested my money into my community. I even taught children like you how to save their money. I lived through the Great Depression of the 1930s. Many banks and stores closed during this time, but my bank doors stayed open.
You know what? I really get it now. Learning your history really is important. It's just like Drake says, it's the journey that teaches you a lot about the destination. Who's <laughs> it? Drake. That definitely was a trade. Let's give it up to Kingdom Kids. Amazing, incredible acting, some costumes, even some accents. I was like, whoa, <laughs> if my history class was like that, I uh, definitely would have paid a lot more attention. Mm -hmm. uh, important things though, and they highlighted some important uh, uh, black Americans throughout history and uh, Incredible, incredible job. Thank you for those who put that together. Super appreciate that. A little more history coming up next with Chasney Russell going to talk about the song that we sing, Wade in the Water. Hey y'all, Chasney here with Riverside Singles Ministry here to talk to you about the famous song, Wade in the Water. Wade in the Water was published for the first time by the Fisk Jubilee Singers in 1901, 119 years ago. At face value, the famous spiritual song seems to encourage people to be baptized in order to find hope for the future, as seen in the Old Testament, Exodus 14, where the Israelites escaped out of Egypt, as well as the New Testament, John 5, 4, where the Course is referring to waiting in the angel troubled water for healing. However, many historians now believe the song is actually a very clever code that gave advice to enslaved Africans from the South on how to escape to Canada. Canada representing Canaan's land and free land, where slavery was illegal. So now let's break down the meaning of the song before we sing it together. Wade in the water, God's going to trouble the water. Sla enslaved Africans who were caught trying to escape would be p punished by death. As an example to other enslaved Africans, this meant that the song had to be disguised as a religious song to avoid suspicion. If you don't believe I've been redeemed, the song needed to offer hope to anyone who tried to escape. It suggested that God is on their side, but also that they can be redeemed, saved by following the instructions. If God's going to trouble the water, I want you to follow him on down to Jordan stream. This is a song that suggests that the safest way of getting to Canada, follow the river. This meant that enslaved Africans could easily navigate at night to avoid being caught. Jordan is also the promised land in the Bible. Here it may have represented the other promised land of Canada. You know, it chills my body, but not my soul. The journey was long, usually a year and uncomfortable to say the least. So the song offered moral support along the way. God's going to trouble the water. It is thought that the enslaved Africans were encouraged to literally wade in the water rather than just walking along the banks of the river. This would pre prevent them being sniffed out by the bloodhounds sent by slave owners. Tell all my friends that I'm coming too. Even though hiding an escaped African slave was punishable by death, people throughout history uh, in the United States agreed to take escapees, known as abolitionists. This network was highly organized and became known as the Underground Railroad. Sometimes I'm leveled to the ground. Another way of avoiding detection, keep low to the ground. God's going to trouble the water. God's going to trouble the water. This song contains many repeated lines and a memorable tune so that it would be easy for escapees to remember. Now let's sing this together. Hey everybody, happy Black History Month. My name is Chasney. This is Brian. And we're part of the Riverside Singles Ministry. Please join us as we sing Wade in the Water. Oh yeah. Wade in the water, wade in the water, children, wade in the water. God's going to trouble the water. If you don't believe I've been redeemed, God's going to trouble the water. I want you to follow him down the Jordan stream. God's going to trouble the water. You know chilly water is dark and cold. God's going to trouble the water. You know it chills my body but not my soul. God's going to trouble the water. Wade in the water. Wade in the water, children. Wade in the water. God's going to trouble the water. Now, if you should back there before I do, 
God's gonna trouble the water. Tell all of my friends I'm coming to. God's gonna trouble the water. Sometimes I'm up, Lord, and sometimes I'm down. God's gonna trouble oh, the water. Sometimes I'm leveled to the ground. God's gonna trouble the water. Wade in the water. In the water. Wade, wade in the water, children, wade. In the water, God's gonna trouble the water. Let's go higher. Wait in the water. Wait in the water, children. Wait in the water. God's gonna trouble 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 the water. In the water, wait in the water, children, wait in the water. God's gonna trouble the water. Nice, nice. That uh sometimes you sing songs, you don't even know what 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 the history was or why they're singing it. And super appreciate uh, Chasney uh telling us about that and her and Brian singing it. I couldn't help but sing. Sing along with them. That was really, really cool. The The next uh, presenters will be uh, members of the squad educational subcommittee. And uh, their, their charge is to teach us and to help us to, to learn and grow in our learning. And those are um, Tracy Walker, Christian Duran, and James Thomas. From one man, he made all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands, Acts 17, 26. For thousands of years, populations have moved across the face of the earth, motivated by turmoil and need, by a will to survive the villainy of other men hungry for power, or by the promise of a better life. Millions have left home and faced the void, uncertain of what lay ahead, with a light of hope and faith to guide their way. Like Ruth, who followed Naomi into a foreign land and labored in the fields of Boaz. Where you go, I will go, and where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my God. Your, pe your people will be my God, my people, I'm sorry, and your God, my, my God. Ruth 1 16. Or Abram, who trusting God left his home and traveled to a place he had never seen walking for a hundred years to become the father of countless generations. The Lord had said to Abram, leave your country, your people, and your father's household, and go to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. Genesis 12, 1. To Joseph, who after being sold into slavery by his wicked brothers, suffered in bondage for 12 years and cried out to God. He was rescued from the pit in order to become a blessing to everyone in Egypt and all those who came from afar. You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. Genesis 50, 20. To the tens of thousands of Jewish men and women whose cries reached the ears of God, those who followed Moses out of Egypt rejoicing after 430 years of slavery and wandered into the desert in search of a home. Commemorate this day, the day you came out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery, because the Lord brought you out of it with a mighty hand. When the Lord brings you into the land he swore to your ancestors to give you, a land flowing with milk and honey. Genesis 13, 3. And to Jesus Christ, who being still in his mother's arms, became a refugee fleeing from Bethlehem into Egypt in order to escape Herod's plot to murder every firstborn son. When they had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said. Take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. Matthew 2:13. God masterfully works his will into the fabric of human existence. He takes the evil things that men have done, the pain and suffering of those who are oppressed, and by his strength and wisdom creates a tapestry of human life 
that proclaims his endless love. Today, we celebrate God's love demonstrated in the lives of a people. It has been 400 years since the first slave ships arrived in Virginia, marking the beginning of a mass exodus of people from the African continent that scattered more than 12.5 million people and their descendants over the face of the earth. Today, as we celebrate Black History Month, let us focus on the enduring spirit of those who, those who are thrust into the churning tide of history and the countless examples of faith, strength, creativity, and love that are made manifest in the lives of those who fight for justice, those who sing and make music even in sadness, who lift others up out of oppression, those who have helped shape the world by holding on to hope, to all those who persevere. We can skip to the next slide. One more. The inspirational African-American uh, historical figure that I'm gonna share about is Ida B. Wells. First, I'm gonna read from John 15, 12. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Lay greater love has no one than this to lay down one's life for one's friend. I chose Ida B. Wells, a woman who made sacrifices to help others despite incredible obstacles. Ida B. Wells was an African-American journalist civil rights advocate and suffragist. Born into slavery in 1862 in Mississippi, Wells was freed by the Emancipation Proclamation of the American Civil War. At age 16, Wells was forced to drop out of college after losing both parents and one of her siblings to yellow fever. She posed as an 18 year old to begin working as a teacher to help care for her siblings. After an incident on a train where she experienced racial discrimination, Ida began writing about issues of race and politics in the South. Wells wrote a number of articles that were published in black newspapers and periodicals. She would later own two newspapers. Wells also continued working as a teacher at a segregated public school in Memphis and was fired in 1891 for criticizing the condition of the segregated schools in the city. After Friend and two, two of his business associates were murdered, Wells began an anti-lynching editorial crusade. Wells began writing articles decrying lynchings in the South and risked her own life to investigate and gather information for her article. After Wells' newspaper office was stormed and destroyed by a mob and her own life threatened, she moved to the North. Wells continued to write extensively on lynching in America and even went to the White House to call on President McKinley to make reform. In 1895, Wells married Ferdinand Barnett with whom she had four children. Wells also formed several, several civil rights organizations, most famously co-founding the NAACP in 1896. Wells also fought for women's suffrage, especially for black women. In conclusion, Wells continued to stand up for many causes she believed in until her death in 1931 at age 68. The person I'm going to be hearing about is Jose Maria Morelos. Jose Maria Morelos was an Afro-Mexican born on September 30th, 1765 into a complex social and historical milieu. Historians initially argued that his dark complexion and curly hair were due to the fact that he was born to a Spanish father and an indigenous mother. But recent research has discovered church records which lists his mother as a quote, free woman meaning that she was either black or mulata, in other words, of African descent. Being born black in Mexico at a time when the country was organized according to a caste system, which valued European ancestry over indigenous and black origins was very difficult for someone like Morelos. He, an academic who did not want to work with his hands all of his life, grew to become a priest under the direction of another notable historical figure, Miguel Hidalgo y Costilla another leader in the independence movement. This despite the fact that people of African descent were generally forbidden from serving as priests in the Catholic church. On September 16th, 1810, as church bells rang in Dolores, Guanajuato, Morelos, along with other prominent political and religious figures, took part in a military effort that would ultimately lead to his death in 1815 and the independence of Mexico from the Spanish crown on August 24th, 1821. Morelos met the obstacles in his life with creativity and determination. 
It is said that he would wear what is now an iconic white bandana on his head to hide his curly hair so that no one would question his heritage. It was not that he was ashamed of his African ancestry as his vision for a more just and fair society demonstrates, but the man was too busy leading a revolution and becoming one of Mexico's most renowned military strategists to deal with the arbitrary and foolish valuations of caste and color. It was Morelos, one of the several African descended men in Mexico who helped free an entire nation from tyranny, whose words continue to resonate today. He said, let slavery and the caste system be forever outlawed. All things being equal, let only vice and virtue distinguish one American from another. Unfortunately, while Mexico has named streets and towns after this iconic figure, while they have even put a satellite in orbit bearing his name, and even though they put his face on currency, the nation continues to struggle with issues of race, color, and class. The fact that over the centuries they have widened his face to conceal his African heritage speaks volumes. But I know, and now you do too, that one of the men who helped end slavery on this continent and took steps towards freeing a nation from a foreign power carried the blood of people who were taken from Africa centuries before. Hey everybody, I recently learned of an incredibly ambitious theologian named James H. Cohn, a pioneer of Black liberation theology, a theology grounded in the experience of African Americans and related to other Christian liberation theologies. In 1969, his book, Black Theology and Black Power, provided a new way to articulate the distinctiveness of theology in the Black church. His message was that of black power defined as, a, as black people asserting the humility or humanity that white supremacy had denied. And that was the gospel in America. Uh, he argued that Jesus came to liberate the oppressed advocating the same thing as black power. When asked what he drew on to develop black liberation theology, Cohn responded, that it was his desire to bring together Martin Luther King Jr. and the Civil Rights Movement and the Malcolm X Black Power Movement. The Black Power Movement, the symbol of being Black and proud in the white racist society of the 60s, uh, and MLK uh, interpreting the gospel at, in such a way that his Blackness and by extension, the struggle for justice faced by every Black American was not at the center of the gospel. Uh, so Malcolm uh, rejected Christianity because it did not address his blackness, his struggle, his oppression. So in an attempt to quote, address his blackness, uh, Cone brought the blackness of, brought blackness of his identity together with the faith that he knew and loved. So in black liberation theology, uh, the black comes from Malcolm X and the theology comes from Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, I empathize with the difficulty uh, of the task that, that he was, uh, attempting to undertake, and that's why I called him ambitious in the beginning. Uh, and I feel that the church is still working uh, on some similar issues, uh, chiefly the issue of finding a point of unity between addressing the decades old struggle of black believers and the gospel uh, interpretations that we're comfortable with. Uh, James H. Cohn uh, has uh, been an inspiration in more ways than one. Uh, and I hope that we're all inspired to find a similar point of unity uh, tonight and in the future. Thank you. I would like to share with you a brief timeline in honor of Black History Month. My caveat is this. For the sake of time, there are only a few highlights, but we hope this will inspire you to do more research and have conversations with your children. The raised fist you see here is a symbol of the resistance and struggle for civil and human rights. It has often been used as a sign of solidarity and encouragement for those who continue to stand for what they believe in. I pray to God to make me strong and able to fight, and that's what I've always prayed for ever since. Harriet Tubman, 1865. African Civilization. Until 600 CE, Africans were sometimes hunter-gatherers, herders, or farmers who raised yams or plantains. Most West Africans lived in small villages and their families, wives, children, extended family, were a sign of wealth. In modern Nigeria, nearly 500 languages are still spoken. 
In the west of Africa, the Kingdom of Ghana traded in gold, salt, and copper between 9th and 13th centuries. Kingdoms of Benin and Ife were led by the Yoruba people, who were known for making objects from bronze, brass, wood, and ivory. In 1619, 20 or so enslaved Africans were brought to Virginia. Again, the African diaspora is the dispersion of Africans and their descendants to various parts of the world during the transatlantic slave trade between the 16th and 19th centuries. This impacts language, culture, and separates communities. Large populations of Africans were transported to the Americas, Brazil, Europe, and South Asia. Congress banned importation of the enslaved in 1808. In 1849, Harriet Tubman helps 300 people escape slavery, and she is noted as saying she could have helped so many more if only they knew they were enslaved. The 13th Amendment is ratified and slavery is abolished in 1865. During Reconstruction, Hiram Revels in 1870 becomes the first Black member of Congress. Black codes and Jim Crow laws were designed to monitor the wages and living situations of the formerly enslaved. This was also a way to restrict the voting rights of African Americans for about 100 years. Jesse Owens wins the 100 meters, 200 meters, and long jump relay in the Berlin Olympics, 1936. Rosa Parks' arrest in 1955 sparked the Montgomery Bus Boycott. The Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee organizes students to challenge Southern segregation laws in 1960. Enter the Freedom Riders. In 1963, the March on Washington and Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s I Have a Dream speech was given. The Civil Rights Act is passed to prohibit discrimination based on race, gender, and religion. Also in 1964, Dr. King is awarded the Nobel Peace Prize. The Voting Rights Act was designed to remove barriers to voting in the South for African Americans in 1965. In 1966, the Black Panther Party is initiated in California by Huey Newton and Bobby Seale in response to police brutality. Though known for many provocative actions, the Black Panther Party also created a free breakfast program held in local churches for neighborhood children, as well as solicited free health care for members of their community. In 1972, the Equal Employment Opportunity Act gives legal place to affirmative action to address past discrimination. Guy Bluford Jr. is the first African-American to go into space on the Challenger space shuttle in August of 1983. Toni Morrison, author of Song of Solomon and Beloved, becomes the first African-American woman to win the Nobel Prize for Literature in 1993. In 2008, Barack Obama, as the 44th U.S. president, becomes the first African-American to hold the office. Ava DuVernay is the director of The 13th, a documentary about the 13th Amendment and the prison industrial complex. She is also an award winner for writing and directing When They See Us, a TV miniseries based on the incarceration of five innocent Black and Hispanic teenagers. And as you know, in 2021, Kamala Harris makes history as the first South Asian and the first African-American female to hold the office of U.S. Vice President. We appreciate you celebrating with us this month, and thank you for listening to and considering our stories. Our histories are diverse, but we are made family through the blood of Christ. Let us continue to remember our past so that we can learn from it. And let us move forward to do great things in the name of our Lord. God bless. And again, thank you. Powerful, powerful stuff. Uh, sobering, inspiring, and, and deep. Uh, thank you again, uh, Tracy, Christian, and James for we're putting that together and we look more forward to more things coming from uh, from your committee but um, very 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 well done thank you
Now we're going to switch a little bit to go from the past. Well, actually the past, they brought us all the way to the present, uh, but now a little bit to the future as hopefully we can have good and uh, respectful, but uh, needed conversations um, regarding uh, racial uh, issues. And so now at this time, we have Tanya Kautz, who has, um, uh, I think, eight principles that uh, she would like to teach us to help have those. Tanya? I thank you, Jeff. This has been an amazing celebration of Black history. We have heard uh, stories of challenge and triumph, and we have learned so much. Thank you to all of you who have shared your hearts with us. As disciples of Jesus, we want to continue our learning. One way that we can do this is to engage in conversation with one another. Just to share a little bit of my background with you professionally, I served on the diversity committee for the entire uh, city of San Antonio. And this committee was composed of individuals from different races, backgrounds, and opinions, much like the squad. The mission of that committee was to work with the city manager and the mayor to promote equity for all citizens in the city of San Antonio. In order for us to do that, we needed to engage in conversations with one another and with our fellow, fellow citizens. And we, need, we needed to not be afraid to engage in conversations about race. When engaging in those very sensitive discussions about race, we adhered to some norms that assisted us in creating safe spaces so that our conversations could be productive. So I want to uh, share uh, some of those uh, norms with you today. And so the first norm is to Stay engaged. So it's important that we try to stay present in the conversation. Discomfort and anxiety are normal parts of racial conversation. Next slide. So the second thing we want to do is stay with the topic. When you feel discomfort, it's easy to take the conversation someplace different. Resist the urge to change the topic. Uh, next slide. And the third thing we want to do is to uh, speak our truth. The purpose of having these conversations is to be able to speak our truth about our personal experiences. And so it's important that we try to create an environment where everyone is free to speak openly so that learning can occur. But we also must keep in mind that people are at different places in this work. In order for us to grow, it's important that people are able to share their thoughts in a way that's comfortable for them. When, when we share our thoughts, it can create uh, an emotional reaction from others. Uh, being able to speak our truth does not mean that people won't respond emotionally. So we just have to be prepared to uh, just experience the discomfort. And before we speak, uh, try to think about what is it that you want others to know? How can they best hear you? Whose interests are being served? And when you're speaking, make sure that you're trying to create allies rather than enemies. And uh, when we do this, we can make sure that new learning can occur for everyone who's involved in the conversation. Next slide. And the fourth thing that we want to think about is um, not, not trying to fix. It's our human nature to want to fix other people's pain and discomfort, particularly when they are crying or clearly distressed. However, it's important 
that we let each person experience their own discomfort and not fix them. This is part of their learning. Next slide. And we've talked a lot about uh, experiencing discomfort. And one way to think about this is to learn to become comfortable with discomfort. In other words, uh, being uncomfortable is expected when we're talking about very uh, sensitive issues like this. And then another thing that I want to make note of is that we can have perfectly safe conversations, but yet still feel uncomfortable. Next slide. We all have to be willing to take risks. The more we are willing to risk, the more potential we have to learn. Next slide. So we need to try to listen for understanding. So when we uh, listen to another person, uh, think about um, where that person is coming from, uh, listen without thinking about how you're going to respond. And I think something that's really important is that if someone is pointing out how what you said make them feel, try not to explain or rationalize what you said or say why you said it. Be careful not to lose the opportunity to just listen. Don't put the focus back on yourself. And then the last thing, um, let's go to the next slide, is expect and accept non-closure. In our society today, we often want to feel some sense of closure regardless of the issue. And there will be uh, fortunate situations where you will be able to resolve something between you and another person, um, but sometimes things will feel unfinished. You may have to circle back at another time to reconcile differences. And at other times, you may even have to sit with non-closure. And be, engaging in racial conversations will mean that sometimes there will be no closure. This is ongoing work that does not necessarily leave one uh, walking away, feeling as if everything turned out the way that you hoped but we still uh, must be willing to uh, take the risk and accept that um, much of this is about changing ourselves, not others. Thank you. Thank you, Tanya. Thank you, very, very well done. So, so good to hear that and just appreciate your experience that you brought from from uh, the city of San Antonio there. Um, and I would say now to your better half, but you're the better half. So uh, now to, you know, my, uh, my good friend, my best friend, uh, Mr. James Counts. Hello everyone. Well, I'm James Counts, I'm the under half. And uh, as one of the co-chairs of the squad with my wife, Tanya, along with Jeff and Millie Mosinger, uh, I'd like to thank everyone uh, for joining us this afternoon for our celebration of Black History Month. First, I just definitely want to thank all of those who spent so much time putting this together. Uh, everything was just incredible. The kids were just phenomenal. Uh, the, the, the history, the background, I, I just thought it was incredible today. Uh, and I definitely want to thank everybody but also I wanna make sure I thank the IE staff for allowing the squad the flexibility to hold such an event. Second, I wanna make sure that we are all clear as to the purpose and or the goal of the squad by reading the passage in Acts chapter two. Acts chapter two and verse five says, that they were staying in Jerusalem, God fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one of them heard them speaking in his own language. Utterly amazed, they asked, are not all of these men who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in his own native language? He says, Parthians, Medes, 
Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt, and all the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongue. You know, from this passage, it makes it very clear that God-fearing people from all over the world were in one place, and they were amazed to hear that the different people declaring the wonders of God in their own native tongue. And that's what the squad is all about, being an instrument to help our family of churches be excited to praise God in a way that highlights the differences that are racial and that are ethnic and that are diversified that we have in our empire churches. Here again, later on in the fourth chapter of Acts, in Acts chapter four, verse 32, it says, all the believers were in one heart and one mind. No one claimed that any of his possessions was his own, but they shared everything they had. You know, all the believers were of the same heart and the same mind. Now you would have to believe if they had an after the church potluck, there would be foods from all over the world at their Sunday worship. And they would highlight the different experiences and the different cultures. And they would be loving to share uh, with the rest of the brotherhood how they grew up and what they've learned. And to this point, the squad is working to ensure that our church highlights the differences that make us one. You see here, uh, here are but a few, couple of few ways that I really believe that we as a squad would like, like to highlight uh, our different cultures, you know, along with how the world highlights the different cultures. Like in the month of March, we have Women's History Month. April, not, not a lot of us know that there's Arab American History Month. In May, there's Asian Pacific American History Month. In June, it's LGBT Pride Month. September, National Hispanic, National Hispanic Heritage Month. In October, they have Filipino American, Italian American, and Polish American Heritage Month. In November, Native American Indian and Alaska Native Heritage Month. And obviously in December, we really celebrate the birth of our Lord and Savior. You know, lastly, I wanna make sure everyone knows that we are wrestling in our squad meetings to try to make sure our church services and outreach events are representative of all who are making Jesus Lord of their lives and all who want to make Jesus Lord of their lives. So I wanna just take a time for us to see the people and the names of the people who are on our squad here in the Inland Empire. And please feel free to reach out to any of them to ask them questions or concerns. Right now you'll see the list of the names coming up on our screen the Sweeney's, the Mussingers, the Counts, the Guayos, Kirkpatrick's, all their names, emails and numbers are up there for us. And you can also take a picture of that with your telephones if you need to, to have that. And we also have a second page of people and names that uh, are on the squad. I don't wanna leave anyone out, but uh, th this is a, a big group and it's a group that really is representative of Blacks and whites, Hispanics, and all races, uh, just like they did in Acts chapter two. You know, in closing out, although the acronym SQUAD stands for social, cultural, unity, and diversity, I personally like the SQUAD acronym that I came up with to be serving Christ, using the auspices of diversity, with auspices obviously meaning with the help or support. So if you read it again, serving Christ, using the help and support of diversity. But isn't that what Jesus Christ is all about anyways? You know, let's take time to close this wonderful afternoon out in prayer. When we finish praying, you can still stay online and fellowship and encourage one another. Let's pray. Father, we are so grateful that, Father, that you really opened up your gospel to all nations. Father, you, you did not want uh, your church to have all Blacks, all Hispanics, all Asian, all whites, 
Father, you wanted your church to be representative of who you are, and that is totally inclusive. And Father, I pray that we can really work hard so, so that could be the thing that we are really doing here in our church here today. Father, I pray that every single person, man, woman, child, no matter what race, they feel encouraged, they feel inspired that they are represented, that they uh, know that, uh, Father, as, as we, as people who uh, don't know Christ, they come into our church and come into our fellowship, they can see Christ, not just uh, by what they see, but what they feel. Father, we love you so much. And again, thank you so much for all the brothers and sisters who have put so much into this day. And Father, we also look forward into the future, uh, putting together uh, things that really highlight uh, women, people of different colors and races all around our churches, Father. We love you and thank you so much for the death of Jesus Christ and his resurrection so that we all can be one under the umbrella. Father, we love you and pray all this in your son's name.